Hello, my name is David Lee and I'm a historian of women's history. I've specialised in social history, Tudor history and have recently delved into Victorian women's history. I'm very pleased to contribute to all things 16th century women and I would like to thank Natalie for having me. It's always great to share my passion for the Tudors. So the topic I'll explore today is one that has often been overlooked. I'm going to discuss the lives of the wives of Tudor traitors that being men who were executed for treason during the reigns of the five Tudor monarchs. Now, before I dive into the lives of these extraordinary women who were married to rather unfortunate men who crossed their sovereign, it's really important for me to outline what a traitor was and what treason meant during the reigns of the Tudors. Treason was one of the worst, if not the worst, crime to be accused of or convicted of during the reigns of the Tudors. Treason was a direct crime against the monarch, the list of crimes that could actually be categorised as treasonous, it really varied. And this could range from voicing an opinion in opposition to the king or queen's will, an attempt on the monarch's life, usurpation of the throne, um, of which there are many examples. <laughs> and it is estimated that perhaps tens of thousands of people were executed during Henry VIII's reign alone. And as we know, his daughter, Mary I, is now actually um, reviled as a Bloody Mary, although this interpretation is actually changing. So there actually exists numerous studies on the many men that were executed during the Tudor period's uh, rather short tenure. Um, some women were even executed for treason themselves, um, perhaps the most famous being Henry VIII's second wife, Queen Anne Boleyn. But for me, it's about the families of those who are executed. What about them? Mainly the wives and the children left behind after the execution of their husbands and fathers. How did they fare after the violent loss of their protectors? How did they deal with the stigma of treason? And who were the women who could call themselves the wives of traitors? So to keep things simple, I will briefly discuss the lives of five wives of Tudor traitors, specifically executed for treason, based on the chronological order of each Tudor reign. That's the five Tudor reigns. So, firstly, we have Lady Catherine Gordon, and Catherine was the wife of the Tudor pretender Perkin Warbeck. Perkin Warbeck claimed to be Richard of Shrewsbury, Duke of York, and he was the youngest son of Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville. So by 1490, the two princes, that's the two sons of Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville, had actually not been seen for many years after their uncle Richard III had by then usurped the throne and declared them illegitimate and their mother and father's marriage invalid. Um, it was believed that the boys had been murdered or spirited away up until around 1490 and Henry Tudor's reign was fairly accepted by this point. But when Warbeck, you know, began to claim the English throne, things began to change. So Henry Tudor, who was the first Tudor monarch, had been king for about five years by this stage after defeating Richard III, of course, at the Battle of Bosworth in 1495. And he had married Edward IV's daughter, Elvis daughter, Elizabeth of York. So back to Catherine Gordon. So Lady Catherine Gordon was actually born in 1474 and she was a Scottish woman of noble stock. Her father was George Gordon, second Earl of Huntley. So Catherine would have been in her early 20s by the time she married Perkin Warbeck in 1497. By this time, Warbeck already had a large following and was even backed by Margaret of Burgundy, who was the sister of Edward IV and Richard III of England. However, many in England and Ireland had already backed this claim for some time and though I'm not really here to discuss the legitimacy or the reasons for his large following, I must note that it, it, it was substantial. This would all have contributed to his marriage to Catherine. Uh, Warbeck's followers to them, Catherine would now have been referred to as the Duchess of York and as support for the tender the pretender grew and mounted. Catherine may have even imagined a grander title for herself, perhaps even that of, of Queen of England. Within the growing, 
you know, support from the French, the Scottish, the Irish, some English. It's really not surprising, and her delusions actually may well have been expected. It's thought that Catherine and Perkin had at least one child, um, but not much is really known about their lives or whether they lived until adulthood or, or who they were, really. Catherine joined her husband in the summer of 1497, and this is when he embarked, really began his, his embarkment on the quest for the crown. Uh, they landed in Cornwall, and uh, Warbeck proclaimed himself Richard IV in, in Cornwall. And the couple's presence in England actually stirred a little bit of rebellion, especially in that area. But it simply wasn't enough for the might of the Tudors. So Warbeck was eventually forced to surrender at Hampshire and was imprisoned in September of uh, 1497. Uh, Catherine herself was later uh, captured at St. Michael's Mount in Cornwall and as I referred to them as the Warbecks, um, they were initially treated well as a couple. Um, so Catherine joined Elizabeth of York's household and Perkin also eventually was employed at court as well. But in 1498, War Warbeck uh, actually attempted to escape and he was unsuccessful. And even though he was then imprisoned, he again attempted to bribe his jailers in order to gain his freedom. Um, and this is when the Earl of Warbeck, uh, sorry, pardon me, uh, Warwick was eventually brought into the fold. And this elaborate plot was formed, or, or elaborate, as, as so they thought. <laughs> um, but the conspirators were actually closely watched, um, and whether from the beginning of their plot or the mid or end, their plot was discovered, and for this, Perkin Warbeck was actually executed at Tyburn uh, on the 23rd of November in 1499. So now Catherine Gordon was a widow, and she remained at court in the service of Elizabeth of York for some time. She was treated with kindness, and of course, as a lady of high rank. And it's actually believed that she became a favourite of the Queen's. She was afforded expensive gifts, a, a really expensive wardrobe, a pension, and then she went on to witness many great events of the Tudor court. She was granted vast lands, worth an absolute fortune for the time, and this is down to her loyalty to the Tudors. But actually, the story doesn't end there. Catherine Gordon married a, four, a further three times, and um, each marriage brought her further lands, income, status, um, and she actually lived right up until, right through Henry VIII's reign. Uh, she witnessed his divorce from Catherine of Aragon, um, his uh, marriage to uh, Anne Boleyn, of course, the execution of the latter, and beginnings of the English uh, Reformation. So by the time she died uh, in, in 1537, Catherine Gordon was relatively uh, wealthy, respected, she had beautiful homes, and she was loved by the Queen. So um, I think despite her first husband's um, uh, execution and the stigma of treason, she actually ended up faring quite well. Now I can actually see here um, from, from the image, this is actually an image of um, Elizabeth of York. Her, her mistress, and you can see her after 1512, she actually lived in Fivefield Manor in Oxfordshire, and um, this would have been, I suppose, in her retirement, in her old age, this is during the, you know, the early reign of Henry VIII, so she would have lived a rather comfortable life here, and as you can see, it's, it's, it's quite beautiful. So another wife of a Tudor traitor um, was actually Alice Moore, born as Harper in around 1475. So Alice is remembered as a woman of great virtue and intellect and also as the second wife of one of England's most famous Catholic martyrs. Unfortunately, like that of, of you know, of, of many, if not most of Tudor women, uh, the, the, the real in-depth, the real details of Alice's life are actually quite sparse. 
Um, some historians, such as Rita Warnick, have discussed Alice's life before, during, and after her marriage to Thomas More. Um, but again, like a, a real substantial, um, you know, uh, delving into or or uh, interpretation of her life is definitely uh, definitely needed. So Alice was the daughter of um Elizabeth uh, Ardern, and she was a co heiress from Essex and also the daughter of Sir Richard Harper. So Alice first married uh, a London mercer, John Middleton, in 1492. Uh, prior to that, the details of her childhood are actually quite elusive, but she would have been educated to the standard of a woman of her class. Um, when her first husband died, Alice was named the executor of his will, and she was actually granted land and some considerable wealth, which would have also been divided between their two daughters um, that, that they had had together. Um, so sometime before 1516, Alice was widowed, and Thomas More's first wife, Jane Colt, had also died. Um, some testimonies mentioned that Thomas married Alice within uh, actually a month of, um, of Jane's death. But whatever the circumstances of their courtship, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not going to delve into that. Um, they were married, definitely, by 1516. Um, though Thomas was actually younger than Alice, uh, the match may have been based on some form of attachment or mutual affection. Uh, Thomas already had four children, and therefore Alice would have taken on the role of, of stepmother. Um, I don't know whether this is unfortunate or fortunate for, for her stepchildren and her own children, but um, she was reputedly stern and she did not suffer fools. Um, Thomas, however, actually trusted her so much that he allowed her to supervise the running of the estate uh, in terms of what the husband, the parts that the husband would have ran at the household um, when he was, you know, he was often absent. So when he was absent abroad or in another area, um, and this is especially um, important when he became Lord Chancellor of, of England during during Henry VIII's reign. So Thomas and Alice rose to prominence, and as their fortunes grew larger, their houses became bigger and more extravagant. The Moors were actually a particularly pious Catholic family, Yet their children were well educated, and this included their daughters. Um, Alice actually presided over what we may what may now be called, I suppose, a blended family. And you know, she was happy. She had a great life. Her husband was was um, you know, was influential and unwealthy. But unfortunately, her happiness and her her bit of autonomy did not last long. In 1530, Thomas More really put his, his life and his family's safety in jeopardy when he refused to sign uh, a letter addressed to the Pope requesting Henry VIII's annulment to his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. And so by 1532, he had actually resigned his position as Lord Chancellor of, Ling of England and refused to sign the oath of supremacy to the King. Sec this was the second time he actually refused. Um, the Moors remained staunchly Catholic during the early period of, of religious reform, and though it was quite unclear at this point what direction this reform would take, you know, hindsight is is, is excellent, but in this time they, they wouldn't have known. Um, you know, it, it was a complicated period for, for the Moors. Um, Thomas not only snubbed Anne Boleyn, by refusing to attend her coronation in 1533, um, but by this time she was pregnant with, um, with uh, Elizabeth I. But he was actually again summoned to sign documents, which he stated that his conscience would not allow him to sign. And therefore, by refusing this, he actually refused the new line of succession. Uh, the oath of the legitimacy of the king's marriage to Anne Boleyn, Anne Boleyn's uh, position as queen, and therefore the legitimacy of, of their daughter, uh, Princess Elizabeth. And you can actually see here um, the, the, the Moore family, um, family portrait um, by Hans Holbein. 
and you can see, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, somebody, but um, I believe the lady kneeling to the far right is, is actually Alice. So eventually, um, the king lost all patience with his favourite and Moore was arrested and tried for treason uh, in July of 1535. And then he was later executed on July 6th, 1535 at Tower Hill. So Alice and her children worked hard to have Thomas freed prior to his execution. But their, peti their pet petitions were basically ignored um, during Moore's imprisonment. Alice was left alone to run their household affairs. And though she had done this for some time, um, the situation was, was different. She did not have the income, the money, the, the, the comforts that she had before. And she complained that her debts were actually mounting. But above all, despite the debts, despite the difficulties at home, she really, what she cared about was her husband and his safety. And she begged to visit and comfort him in his, in his prison. Unfortunately, after Thomas's execution, Alice was embroiled in a string of lawsuits with her own stepchildren over the land and the inheritance. And her final years were really stressful and, and, and rather poor, sadly. Um, she never fully regained the respect once owed to her as, you know, the Lord Chancellor's wife. Uh, and this, we're not quite sure, but this would have really affected her and her, her position and therefore the, the quality of her life. Um, she was afforded a small annuity from 1537, but this really didn't make up for the loss of her husband, her position and her previous fortune. Um, she never remarried, but she did have, you know, a close relationship with her children and she had many grandchildren and, and an extended blended family, despite their difficulties. Um, Alice's death, kind of ranges somewhere between 1546 and 1551 where we're not quite sure but there is no doubt that she died in obscurity and you know this is so unfortunate for a woman who was you know during her husband's tenure as Lord Chancellor was so respected and and she was you know so intelligent and really really a strong woman um, and you would have to be to to go through that uh, and to um to have to live with that afterwards for so many years um her husband was actually later canonized in 1935 so 400 years later as uh, saint thomas more and here is a beautiful uh stained glass uh, window inter uh, interpretation or um portrait of him and i think it's it's rather beautiful i i, I love the blue or perhaps that's perhaps that's purple. I'm not quite sure, <laughs> but I I love it either way. So, the next um the next uh, woman we're going to speak of is Anne Seymour, uh, the Duchess of Somerset. Um, Anne Seymour, uh, she's another example of a woman who really had to to pick up the pieces after her husband's downfall and execution for treason. And actually, Anne is my favourite of all the five women of today's discussion. And perhaps you'll see why. So she was born Anne Stanhope in around 1510 to Sir Richard Stanhope and his wife, Elizabeth uh, Bourchier. Please forgive me if I'm if I'm botching that. Um, <laughs> do let me know if there's a, a better way to pronounce that. But um, she, were, she was, pardon me, her parents' only child. But she did have half siblings. Um, her father died when she was an infant and her mother later remarried. Um, and based on what we know, she was clearly educated to the extent that her intelligence and her wit would provoke comment later on in her adult life. In 1535, during the reign of Henry VIII and his second wife, Anne Boleyn, um, Stanhope actually married uh, Sir Edward Seymour. And Seymour was actually the brother of Jane Seymour, who in 1536 became Henry VIII's third wife after the execution of Anne Boleyn, his, his second wife. Um, Jane not only supplanted Anne Boleyn, but the Seymour family supplanted the Boleyns and had 
for some time been climbing the social ranks at the Tudor court. Um, Anne herself was a religious former, a reformer, pardon me, like her husband Edward, who later became the Earl of Hertford in 1536, and this made Anne a countess. Seymour then created himself as the Duke of Somerset upon his child nephew Edward the uh, sixth accession as the king. And this was when, of course, Henry VIII died in 1547. The Seymours, Seymours were actually at the pinnacle of power. And as the aunt of the king and the wife of the Lord Protector, Anne had significant power and autonomy. So Anne Seymour was a significant player in the patronage of the Reformed religion. And like her husband, the Lord Protector, she was seen as a supporter of reformist writings. Um, sadly, Anne had actually gained a poor reputation, uh, even during her own lifetime, as a controlling or so might call it manipulative wife, attempting to influence her husband in matters of politics or religion. But this interpretation has actually since been challenged as sexist and biased. Indeed, Anne may well have attempted to influence her husband and I suppose aid the cause of others, but this would have been expected for a woman of her position and whether her husband heeded her counsel on every matter is is actually speculative. Um, Anne was said to be bold, witty, intelligent, and actually rather proud. Um, but this often brought her enemies. So eventually Edward Seymour himself came under fire from the Privy Council and a conspiracy to, I suppose, uproot him from the power uh, that he had gained was, was well underway by this time. Um, when her husband was arrested in 1549 uh, and again in 1551 and was sent to the tower on charges of treason and defended and supported his, uh, her husband. Um, but his fall from power really had a rippling effect for, for those close to the Seymours and, and the remaining Seymours themselves. Um, Seymour was eventually executed. Um, for treason in January of uh, 1552 and his ambition and greed were really at the root of his downfall. Um, he was later replaced by John Dudley who was the Earl of, uh, of Warwick. Anne actually followed her husband to the tower in um, 1551 and the reasons for her imprisonment are actually unclear. It's thought that Despite this, she would have been treated quite well during her incarceration. Um, and even after her ex her husband's execution, Anne was not released from the tower until late 1553, by this time Queen Mary I, after, of course, Edward VI had died, and he had not yet reached his majority. Um, she received thousands of pounds then in jointure and annuity, and by 1558 she was even granted her own lands and a manor in, in, Han, in Hanworth. And despite her apparent arrogance, pride, and I suppose one would call reformist views, she was really well liked by Mary Tudor. So Anne Sanholm survived the downfall of her husband and the Seymour family. Um, she later would remarry a much uh, younger <laughs> Francis uh, Newdigate in uh, 1559 and though she had 10 children with the Lord Protector she went on to have even more with Newdigate and she luckily became a close friend to the last Tudor monarch Elizabeth I. Her quiet and happy life for a time it would not really last very long and um, by 1560 her eldest son um, had actually married Lady Catherine Grey, um, who was a cousin of the Queen's, and also without royal consent. Um, and though she claimed to know nothing of the match, her children were closely watched under house arrest. Um, but despite that, her, she herself remained in, in generally good favour with the Queen and, and court. She spent her holidays at, at court with the Queen, she was awarded many manners and titles and eventually, 
when she died in 1587, she was aged around 77. So for the time, that was quite old. She'd lived a very um, unusual yet full life. And she was buried in Westminster Abbey. And by the time she died, she was rich. She was respected. And um, I suppose above all, she remained shrewd, intelligent and passionate. And in the end, had also survived the stigma of treason. The next um, woman I would like to discuss is actually um, Margaret or Marguerite uh, Cranmer. And she remains one of the most enigm enigmatic um, women to have lived during the Tudor period. She was the wife of Thomas uh, Cranmer, the reformist um, Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, Marguerite was likely born in Nuremberg in Germany, but little is known of her origins and early life, or even her life as a, as a whole. Um, she was certainly connected to the reformist ideolo ideology before she met Thomas, and this would have been while he was acting as ambassador on behalf of Henry VIII in 1532. Um, her uncle had some sort of friendly connection to Thomas Cranmer, and this is likely how they met. But whatever the circumstances, by July of 1532, they were married. And months later, Marguerite actually returned to England where her new husband. Uh, and this is when he was called to succeed as uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. So by this time, Henry VIII was desperately trying to annul his marriage to uh, his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, and to marry um, Anne Boleyn. And as the, reform, as the Reformation was beginning to sweep across England, um, despite its, its long-standing connection with the Catholic Church, um, Cranmer really was the best candidate to officiate the marriage of Henry and Anne and to get things moving in the direction that the couple wanted, whether this be their marriage, the succession, um, the... the, uh, the you know, oaths of supremacy, the whatever reforms to the church. And unfortunately, clergy celibacy remained unchanged in England at this time. And therefore, the Cranmer's marriage was not actually, it was not technically valid. And uh, this is by church, by law, whatever it was. And it's even believed that Marguerite, uh, Marguerite hid in a box or some would say a chest when traveling with her husband from province to province. Um, so whether the couple lived openly in England remains a topic of, of debate, discussion, but as the religiosity of England began to sway towards uh, Protestant values, Protestantism in general, and the dissolution of the monasteries was, was well underway by 1530, by 1536, um, the Cranmers likely lived openly as man and wife. Now, Thomas Cranmer was actually close to Anne Boleyn, and during her downfall, he did all that he could to support her, and even stated that he suspected she was not guilty of the charges that were, that were brought against her. It is unclear how Marguerite herself felt, or what she thought during this tumultuous time, um, or even if she knew Anne Boleyn very well but her husband definitely mourned the death of the late queen himself anyway the Cranmers had at least two children uh, a daughter Marguerite and a son named Thomas and both were named for their parents and um, Margaret spent many years away from Thomas with her children from around 1539 and then she only returned to England upon the accession of, of, Ed, of Edward VI and uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but their marriage was, was common knowledge during the 1550s and by then, by then it was generally accepted a, 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 as valid. So the Cranmer's look would again change upon the death of Edward VI in 1553. Um, Mary I, uh, the eldest daughter of Henry VIII, succeeded as Queen Regnant and she was determined 
from the get-go to return England to Catholicism. She really blamed Thomas, amongst many, for her mother's banishment and divorce and the ill treatment of Catherine of Aragon. And he was arrested and charged with treason within months of, of Mary's accession. Um, Marguerite may have sought refuge in Germany or went into hiding in England, but I really don't think they would have expected it so quickly for for Thomas to be arrested or even at all. Um, but her husband was actually executed uh, by burning in 1556. Um, and though tragic, Margaret's story did not actually end here. She later married a London printer and reformer named Edward Ed Whitchurch, who was a colleague of her late husband's. And by the time Elizabeth I was queen, Marguerite's second husband had also died and she was left a generous enough income and grants from, from both of her husbands by this time to, to live quite well. But Marguerite again married in around uh, 1564. This marriage, however, was was not a happy one, and the couple eventually lived separately, and Margaret would later reside in Kirkstall until her death in 1571. And here you can actually see a, a, an image of, of Kirkstall. Um, it, it, it's obviously uh, not what it would have been at the time she, she lived in it, but um, I still think it's quite beautiful. Um, and here on the right you can see um, this, this beautiful statue of Thomas Cranmer and again as you can see he remains a revered uh, figure of, of, of the Reformation. So the final traitor's wife I would like to discuss is Frances Walsingham uh, and she was the wife of Elizabeth I's uh, favourite Robert Devereux, Earl of uh, Essex and daughter of the Queen's uh, spymaster, um, Sir Francis Walsingham. Um, unlike many of the women discussed today, Francis's life and her story has been recorded and discussed to a, a much higher degree. We know much more about her. Um, she was born in 1567 during the reign of the Protestant Queen Elizabeth I. Her father uh, would, have, would have become Secretary of State. He would eventually become Secretary of State and was a trusted advisor and confidant of the Queen's. And he also had a, a great relationship with the, with the great statesman, um, William Cecil, uh, also known as Lord Burley. Um, her mother was Ursula St. Barb, and uh, she was actually herself a favourite lady-in-waiting to, to Elizabeth I. As she was her parents' only surviving child, Frances would have been considered quite precious, whether she was a girl or not. And therefore, it is actually extraordinary that she was married so young, aged just 16, to um, Philip Sidney. And Philip Sidney was a courtier and a well-known poet uh, of, uh, of the Elizabethan uh, period. Um, her father is the one that most likely arranged this marriage due to the the, um, the Sydney's prospects. Uh, Francis and Philip were actually married in 1583 and she quickly became pregnant. Her daughter was uh, born in 1585 and was named Elizabeth. And this is, of course, in honor of the Queen. Uh, Philip was our already acting as a provincial governor in the Netherlands and France. And so, um, of course, she would have had to stay at home in England while pregnant, but she joined him after the birth of Elizabeth. Um, by 1586, Frances was pregnant again, but Philip unfortunately died after an injury in battle and she thereafter had, uh, had a miscarriage and, and returned to England. So quite sad for her. Uh, this period. Um, in 1590 her father had died and she was left a substantial annual income. So Francis then married the Queen's favourite Robert Devereux, second Earl of Essex, and this is in 1590, and he was the stepson of, of again of her of her late favourite Robert Dudley, 
uh, uh, yeah, stepson of uh, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. Um, their marriage angered the Queen as they had not obtained royal consent, they had not consulted with her, but they were eventually forgiven. And this is, of course, because Devereux was so close to the Queen and, 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 and such a close friend of hers. Um, so Frances was again in favour. She was wealthy and she went on to have more children were her were her second husband by the 1590s. Um, however, by 1600, Robert Devereux had long fallen in and out of favour with the Queen um, before conspiring against her government and attempting to take control of the Queen's person. So he was actually arrested and sent to the Tower and his, his followers soon dispersed. He was really left with nobody and really nothing. And for him, this is the final straw. This this is the final straw for the Queen. And though she favoured him greatly and she, she loved him dearly, he was actually executed in 1601 for treason. I'll slide here. Um, she would have raised Francis' son, Robert, in his mother's absence. Um, but Francis went on to have more children with, uh, with her third husband. So the couple kind of moved, fluctuated between Ireland and England. They built new luxurious homes, um, for the growing family. And Francis Burke, as she was later referred to, died in 1632, age around 65 years old. So she was, she was old enough for the time and she had lived a good and full life. And luckily, uh, she survived her second husband's treachery, although she did not really survive the, the stigma of that treachery, of, of that treason. But she still went on to live a happy and healthy and wealthy life with her third husband. So, I hope you've enjoyed my talk on the wives of traitors, as much as I myself have enjoyed sharing my thoughts and knowledge about them. Um, and once again, I would really like to thank Natalie for, for having me on again. Um, it's been great.